the Gorge of Clevinger. The sun had already set as Nicholas Asherton reached Hodmerton, then a very small village indeed, and alighted at a little inn near the church, found the ale so good, and so many boon companions assembled to discuss it that he would fain have tarried with them for an hour or so. But prudence for once getting the better of inclination, and suggesting that he had fifteen or sixteen miles still to ride over a rough and lonely road, part of which lay through the Gorge of Clevinger, a long and solitary pass among the English Pennines, and more Moreover, had a large sum of money about him, tore himself away by a great effort, on quitting the smiling valley of Hodmerton, and going near the dangerous defile for mention, some misgiving crossed him, and he almost reproached himself with only hardness to venture in within it at such an hour, and all he intended. Several recent cases of robbery, some of them attended by murder, had occurred within the past, and these now occurred so forcibly to the squire, that he had half inclined to ride back to Hodmerton, and engage two or three of the coppers he had left at him to serve him as an escort as far as Burnley, but he dismissed the idea as soon as formed, and casting one look at the green and woody slopes around him, struck spurs into Robin and dashed into the gorge. On the right was a precipice, on the bare crest of which stood a heap of stone, high of black holland, the remains probably of a cairn. On this commanding point, Nicholas perceived the female figure that led to the gigantic ocean against the sky, who as far as he could distinguish, seemed watching him making signs to him apparently, go back and paid little regard to them, and soon afterwards lost sight of her. Precipitous and almost inaccessible rock of every variety of form and use, some springing perpendicularly up like the spire of a church, others running along in the broken ridges, or presenting the appearance of high embattled walls, the ribbon into the gullies, their opening into wild, savage glen, fit spots for robber and buscade, now presenting a bare smooth surface, now jagged, shattered, shelving, woven the brushwood, sometimes leaf and bore as in the case of a chemical for I call the white curd, sometimes green with moss or grey with vision, sometimes all but barely shaded with timber, as in the approach to the cavern named the Earl's Bower, but generally bold and naked and sombre in tint as the beliefs employed by the savage wars. Such were the distinguished features of the Gorge of Livinger when Nicholas traversed it. Now that high embankments and mighty arches of the railway fill all its recesses and span its the roar of the engine is heard whereby a bird operate a lonely sound. The cloud of steam surplace of the mist wreaths on its Christ. Formerly the high cliffs abounded with all the rocks echoed their yells and screeches spots adjoining their nests, the assembled, in the words of a historian of the district, which are little charnel houses for the born game, formerly also on some inaccessible point built a rock eagle, and reared it through from year to year. The gaunt wolf had once raged the glen, and the sly fox and fierce cat and mountain still harboured within them, nor were those the only objects of dread. The superstitious declared gorge was haunted by a rival, high shoot demon, white cleft hovers. The general savage character of the ravine was relieved by some spots of exquisite beauty, where the traveller might have lingered with delight if apprehended of a salt on robber or busy of others had not urged him on numberless waterfalls looking from fissures in the hills caused down their seamy sides looking like threads of silver as they sprang from point point. One of the most beautiful of these cascades, issuing from a gully in the rocks near the cavern called the Earl Bower, fell in rainy seasons in one unbroken sheet of a hundred and fifty feet, though the mist of the gorge ran a swift and rolling stream known by the appellation of Calder, but it must not be confounded with river going past Wally Abbey. The course of this impetuous current was not always restrained within its rocky channel, and when swollen by heavy rain, it would frequently invade the narrow causeway running beside it, and spreading over the whole width of the gorge, rendered the road almost impassable. Though this rocky and sombre defile, and by the side of the brawling Calder, which dashed swiftly past him, Nicholas took his way, the hawks were yelling overhead, the rocks were calling on the topmost branches of some tall timber, on which they built a raven was croaking lustily in the wood. A pair of eagles were soaring in the still glowing sky. By and by, the glen contracted and a wall of steep rocks on either side hemmed the shuddering traveller in. Instinctively, he struck spurs into his horse and accelerated his pace. The narrow glen expands the precipice for farther by, and the traveller breathes more freely. Still, he does not relax his feet, for his imagination has been at work in the gloom. People in his path with lurking robbers or grinning bogarts, he begins to fear he shall lose his gold and execrate his folly or enduring risk, but it is too late now to turn back. It grows rapidly dust, the objects become less and less thin, assuming fantastical and fearful form. Glass the tree, clinging to a rock, and thrusting a bare branch across the road. Looks as wild, a bandit, and a white owl bursting from a bush shares him as if it had been a burst himself. However, in spite of these several alarms, for which he is indebted to excited fancy, he hurries on, and 
is receding at a wandering pace When all at once his horse comes to a stop Arrested by a tall female figure Resembling that seen near the mountain Khan At the entrance of the gorge Nicholas's blood ran cold But though in this case he could not apprehend plunder He was fearful of personal injury For he believed the woman to be a witch Mustering up courage however He forced Robin to proceed If his progress was meant to be barred A better spot the purpose could not have been selected A narrow road scarcely to be ran round the ledge of a tremendous crash, jutting so far into the glen that he almost met the steep barrier of rocks opposite it. Between these precipitous crags dashed the river in the foaming cascade, nearly twelve feet in height, and the steep narrow causeway winding beside it, as above described, was rendered excessively slippery and dangerous from the constant wild spray arising from the wall. At the highest and narrowest point of the ledge, and behind nearly one wall of its base, with an overhanging rock on one side of her, and a roaring torrent on the other, stood a tall woman, determined apparently from her attitude and deportment to oppose the squire's further progress. As Nicholas advanced, he became convinced that it was the same person he had seen near the car. But when her features grew distinguishable, he found to his surprise that it was Nance Redfern. Hello, and Nancy cried, what are you doing here, lass? Eh, come to warn ye, squire, she replied. You're wanting me a service, and I anna forget it. That's why I watched you from the Carn cliffs and marched ye to go back. But didn't understand my signs, so or wouldn't heed them. So I come here to say ye, you're in danger, I tell ye. In danger of what, my good woman, demanded the squire uneasily. I've been robbed and plundered of your gold, replied Nan. There are five men waiting to set upon ye a mile farther on at order stone. Indeed, exclaimed Nicholas, they will get little for their pains. I have no money about me. Don't think to deceive me, squire, rejoined Nan. I know you have borrowed three hundred pounds I gold from young Richard Ashton, and I surely as ye had it all under your jerkin, so surely will you lose it if you don't turn back. All ye on without me keeping ye company. I have no objection on earth to your company, Nan, replied the squire. Quite the contrary. But how the devil should these rascals expect me? And above all, how should they conjecture I should come so well provided for? Soon to say, such is not ordinarily the case with me. I know it well, Squire replied Nance with a laugh. But they have received certain information of your movement. There is only one person who could give them such information, cried Nicholas. But I cannot, will not suspect him. If you're thinking of Lawrence Fogg, you're not far wide of the mark, Squire replied Nance. What Fogg lead with robbers impossible, exclaimed Nicholas. No, it's not impossible at all that, returned Nance. You and stare when I tell you. You, he has robbed you money at a time without your being aware on it. You were unwise enough to send him round to your friends borrow money for you. True, so I was, but luckily no one would lend me any, said Nicholas. There you're wrong, squire, or unluckily they all did, replied Nance with a scarcely stressed laugh. Roger Norwell hid him one under Timus Whitaker, a warm another, Roger Parker, a browse warm another, and more in the same way, and the rascal pocketed it all, and never brought me back one farthing, cried Nicholas in a transport of rage. I'll have him hanged, sure. Hanging's too good for him to deceive me. His friend, his benefactor, his patron, in such a manner to dwell in my house, eat at my table, drink my wine, wear my habiliments, ride my horses, hunt with my hounds. Has the dog no conscience? Very little, I'm afraid, replied Nan. And the worst of it is, continued the squire, new lights breaking in upon him. I shall be liable for all the sums he has received. He was my confidential agent, and the lenders will come upon me. It must be six or seven hundred pounds that he has obtained in this nefarious way. Zounds, I shall go mad. You were to blame for trusting him, squire, rejoined Nance. You ought to have made proper inquiries about him at first, and then you'd have found out what sort of chap he were. But now I tell ye, Lawrence Fogg is chief of a band of robbers, and all the black and villainous deeds done of late in this place have been perpetrated by his men. A poor gentlemen were murdered by him, I did. It's very thought that we all last, and his body cast into the river. Fogg, of course, had no hint in the fall he, for he would not have interfered to prevent it if he had been here, for he never scrupled shedding blood, and if he had been the Content with robbing you, squire. I wouldn't have betrayed him, but when he caused you your battle, because as he said, dead men tell no tales. I could hold out no longer and resolve to give you warning. What a monstrous and unheard of villain, cried the squire. But is he one of the ambuscade? Nance replied in the affirmative. Then by heaven I will confront him. I will hew him down, pursued Nicholas, gripping the hilt of his sword. No use, I tell ye. You'll be overpowered and killed, said Nance. Take me with you and, and carry you safely through them all. But get alone and ye never see down them again. And now it's reached. I should tell you who Lawrence Fogg really is. What new 
wonder is in so me cry Nicholas. Who is he? Maybe you have heard tell that Mother Demdi had a son and a daughter required and the daughter being of course Elizabeth Vice and the son Christopher Demdi being supposed to be dead. However son, this is not the case for Lawrence Fogg is he? I guess as much when you began cry Nicholas, he was a cursedly bad look about the eyes. Damn Demdi fizzy no me. What an infernal villain the fellow must be without a shot of natural feeling. Why he has this very day assisted at his nephew's catcher and caused his own sister to be arrested or I have been properly due. I to lodge a son of that infernal hag in my house, feed him, clothe him, make him my friend, take him, the viper, to my bosom. I have been rightly served, but he shall hang, he shall hang. That is some constellation, though slight. But how do you know all this, man? Don't ask me, she replied. Whatever I have been to, Christopher M.D., I bear him no love now. For, as I have told you, he is a black-hearted, murdering villain. But let me get up behind you, and I bring you through scatterless. And tomorrow, you may arrest the whole band at Malkin Tower. Malkin Tower, exclaimed the squire in fresh surprise. What? Have these robbers taken up their quarters there? This accounts for all the strange sights said to have been seen there of late, and which I treated as me a fable. But I, a terrible thought crosses me. What have I done? Mistress Nutter will be there tonight. I have sent her death and destruction. She will fall into their hands. I must go there at once. I cannot take any assistance with me. They will betray the poor lady. If you entrust me, and I can help you through the difficulty, replied Nan. Get up then quickly, lass, since it must be so, rejoined Nicholas. With this, he moved forward, and giving her his hand, she was instantly seated behind him upon Robin, who seemed no way incommoded by his double burden, but dashed down the farther side of the causeway in answer to a sharp application of the spur. Passing her arms round the squire's waist, Nance tamed her seat well, and in this way they rattled along, heedless of the increasing difficulties of the road or the fast gathering gloom. The mile was quickly passed, and Nance whispered in the squire's ear that they were approaching the boulder stone. Presently they came to a narrow glen, half filled with huge rocky fragments detached from the toppling precipices on either side, and forming an admirable place of ambuscade. One rock larger than the rest completely commanded the pass, and as the squire advanced, a thundering voice from it called him to stay, and the injunction being disregarded, the barrel of a gun was protruded from the bushes covering his brow, and a shot fired at him. Though well aimed, the ball struck the ground beneath his horse's feet, and Nicholas continued the way unmoved, while the bolty marksman jumped down the crag. At the same time, four other men started from their places of concealment behind the stone, and levelling their calibers at the fugitive's fire, the sharp discharges echoed along the gorge, and the shots rattled against the rock, but none of them took effect, and Nicholas might have gone on without further hindrance, but despite Nance's remonstrances, who urged him to go on, he pulled up to a way to come in a person who had challenged him. Scarcely an instant elapsed before he was beside the squire, and presented a petronel at his head. Notwithstanding the gloom, Nicholas recognised him. Ah, is it thou, accursed traitor? cried Nicholas. I could scarcely believe in thy villainy, but now I am convinced. The jade you have got behind you has told you who I am, I see. Replied Bob, I will settle with her and none, but this will save her the explanations with you, and he discharged the petronel full at the squire, but the ball rebounded as if his doublet had been quilted. It was, in fact, lined with gold. On seeing the squire under the robber captain uttered an exclamation of rage and astonishment. You are mistaken, you see, perfidious villain, cried Nicholas. You have yet to render an account of all the wrong you have done to me, but meantime you shall not pass unpunished. And as he saw, he snatched the petronel from Bob, with the end dealt him a tremendous blow on the head, felling him to the ground. By this time, the other robbers had descended from the rocks, and seeing the fall of their leader, rushed forward to avenge him, but Nicholas did not tarry for any further encounter, but fully satisfied with what he had done, struck spurs into Robin and galloped off. For a few minutes he could hear the shouts of the men, they soon afterwards died away. Little more than Arthur Ravine had been traversed when the rencontre above described took place, but though the road was still difficult and dangerous, and rendered doubly so by the obscurity, no further hindrance occurred, till just as Nicholas was within the gloomy intricities of the gorge, and approaching the more open country beyond it, at this point Robin fell, rolling both him and Nance, and when the animal rose again, he was found to be so much injured that it was impossible to mount him. There was no resource but to proceed firmly, which was still three or four miles distant on board. In this dilemma, Nance volunteered to provide the squire with another seat, but he resolutely refused the offer. No, no, none of your broomsticks for me, he cried. No devil horses. I don't know where they may carry me. My own legs must serve me now. I'll just take old Robin out of the road, and then trudge off Burnley as fast as I can. With this, he led the horse to a small green mead, skirting the stream, and taking off his saddle and bridle, and depositing them carefully under a tree, patted the animal on the neck, promising to return for him on the morrow, and then set off at a brisk pace, with Nance walking beside him. They had not gone far, however, when the clattering of hooves was heard behind them, and it was evident that several horsemen were rapidly approaching. Nance stopped to listen for a moment, and then declaring that it was MD and his band in pursuit seized the squire's arm and drew him out of the road under the shelter of some bushes. 
of the hazel. The robber kept him on the abeam some it appeared, and as soon as he had recovered from the effects of the law, and mounted his horse, which was concealed with those of his men behind the rocks, and started after the fugitive. Such was the construction put upon the matter by Nance, and the bent through it correct. A loud shout from the horseman, and a sudden halt proclaimed that poor Robin had been discovered, and this circumstance seemed to give great satisfaction to them. He loudly declared that they were now sure of all taking the run away. They cannot be far off, he cried, but they will most likely attempt to hide themselves, so look well about you. So saying, he rode on, and it was evident from the noise that men implicitly obeyed his injunction. Nothing, however, was found, and ere many minutes then he came up, and glancing at the hazel behind which the fugitives were hidden, he discharged Petronel into the larger tree. But as no movement followed the report, he said, I thought I saw something move here, but I suppose I was mistaken. No doubt they have got on farther than we expected, or are retired into some of the coast, in which case it will be useless in search for them. However, we will make sure of them in this way. Two of you shall form an ambuscade near home, and two farther on within half a mile of Burnley, and shall remain on the watch till dawn, so that you will be sure to capture them, and when taken, make away with them without hesitation. Unless my soul had been of the strongest, that shall be squire would have right so he shall have no grace for me. And as to that treacherous witch, Nance Redburn, she deserves death at our hands, and she shall have her deserts. I have long suspected her, and indeed was a fool to trust one of the vile chatter through, who are all my natural enemies. But no matter, I shall have my bed. The men having promised compliance with their captain's command, he went on. As to myself, he said, I shall go forth with and as fast as my horse can carry me to Mountain Tower, and I will tell you why. It is not that I dislike the game we are upon, but I have better to play just now. Tom Shaw, the cockmaster at Downham, who is in my hay, rode over to Wally this afternoon, bring me word that a certain lady, who has long been concealed in the manor house, will be taken to Mountain Tower tonight. The intelligence is certain, for he had obtained it from old Ralph, the huntsman, who is to escort her. Thus, Mistress Nutter, for you all know whom I mean, will fall naturally into our hands, and we can bring any sums of money we like out of her, for though she has abandoned her property to her daughter Alison, she can no doubt have as much as she wants, and I will take care, she asks plenty, or I will try the effect of some of those instruments of torture which I would lucky enough find in the dungeons of Mount Tower, and which were used for a like purpose by my predecessor, Black and Freebooter. Are you content, my lad? Aye, aye, Captain Demdee, they replied. Upon this, the whole party set forward, and were speedily out of hearing. As soon as they thought the prudent to come forth, the squire and Nancy emerged from their place of shelter. What is to be done? exclaimed the former who was almost in a state of distraction. The villain has announced his intention of going to Malkin Tower, and Mistress Nutter will assuredly fall into his hand. Oh, that I could stop him. Oh, get there before him. You shan if you like to ride me, said Nance. But how, in what way, has Nicholas? Leave that to me, replied Nance, breaking off a long branch of hazel. Take hold of this, she cried. The squire obeyed, and was instantly carried off his legs, and whisked through the air at a prodigious rate. He felt giddy and confused, but did not dare to leave go, lest he should dash in pieces, while Nance's wild laughter rang in his ears. Over the police and Perpendicular cry startling the eagle of Miss Ira over the yawning gully with a torrent roaring beneath him, over the sharp ridges of the hill, over Townley Park, over Burnley Steeple, over the wide valley beyond. He went until at last, bewildered, out of breath, and like one in a dream, he alighted on the brow, bare he fair expanse, and within a hundred yards of a tall circular stone structure which he knew to be Mountain Tower.